Are you ready to perform at your highest potential? Thank you for joining this GP Strategies webinar, where we'll explore best practices and innovative insights to help you and your organization improve performance. Hello and welcome to our discussion today on career development in 2023. Perspective and Paradox with GP Strategies' very own Katie Bailey and Leah Clark, who's the founder of Leader Connect. My name is Kim Hiram with GP Strategies, and I'm happy to be your host for today's session. So again, before we get started, I just want to say, and I will put it in the chat as well, a link to the recording will be provided in a follow-up email. Not only will you get a link to the recording, you'll get a copy of the slides and hot off the presses, the report itself that we're going to be discussing today, some really great reading for the weekend ahead. So also, even though our all our lines are muted and we always want this time together to be as interactive as possible, we encourage you to contribute during today's webinar using the chat feature like we are right now. So if you have any comments for the presenters and or just to be engaged with the other attendees that are on today, use that feature. We love it. Also, but if you do have any specific questions for our presenters, you wanna make sure to use the Q&A option. This allows us to monitor the questions coming in and Katie and Leah can answer them either during the presentation or at the end if there's time is allotted. So we really have a great session today. I really appreciate every single one of you taking your time out today to join us. And I'm really excited to introduce you to our, our presenters for today. So Leah Clark's a thought leader, author, and founder of Leader Connect. She's also an extended member of our GP Strategies team. We love her here. She researches, writes, speaks on the topics of leadership, has written several articles and research reports, including pieces on authentic leadership, communication, leading during uncertainty, leadership mindsets, and the impact of introversion and mindfulness on innovation. Leah holds her master's of organizational psychology from Columbia University and her bachelor's in English and sociology from Boston College. What can't Leah do? We don't know. We haven't found it yet. <laughs> we also have Katie. Katie is a learning, Katie Bailey is a learning strategist, consultant, and a thought leader in the field of leadership development. Her career has always been in, involved in training and education in some form from public health outreach and higher education to her current role here at GP in corporate learning. Katie holds a master's degree in organizational development from the University of San Francisco and, uh, and higher education administration, as well as a SHRM CP credential. Whew, that's a lot, you guys. That's a lot of brain power. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to hand it off to you, Katie and Leah. I wish you a great session. And if anybody needs any assistance in the technical, please feel free to reach out to me directly. Over to you, ladies. Thank you, Kim. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and Katie, if you can move to the first slide, which uh, is our chat. First of all, good morning, good afternoon, good evening for those of you dialing in from um, many places around the world. I can see all those locations in the chat. I'm dialing in and with you from New Jersey. So a couple of other folks. I'm from New Jersey in addition to Springsteen and Bon Jovi. Um, so thanks for putting that in the chat. And we'd like to invite you to answer this question in the chat. If you could describe your career, let's go with right now, in one word or phrase, what would that be? Um, and I see another Leah has chimed in and put a word in there. Um, you know what, Katie, I'm going to ask you, and, and bonus points if you want to do a metaphor. I'd love for you to throw a metaphor in there as well. So Katie, what about you? So when I think about my career, I was actually thinking to what Kim was mentioning in my bio. I try to think of it almost like a three-act play. Um, where each act is different and distinct, um, but there is something that ties it all together. And for me, that, that thing that ties it together is education. So as I sit here in act three and the work that I do at GP Strategies with leadership development and research, um, I, I really definitely think of it as the play perspective. What about you? Yeah, so uh, Katie and I chatted a little bit about this. I've been very into food-related metaphors lately, and I see somebody put in the chat stale, so um, mm -hmm. maybe maybe we're kindred spirits. I wouldn't use stale, but I would use a food metaphor. Mine um, feels kind of twisty, like I was thinking of a twisted pretzel, and it sort of goes in different directions, but it comes together in something that's rather delicious and unexpected, so kind of 
twisty and that was the the metaphor that popped into my mind um would love for you to keep putting in the chat how you would describe your career you might be interested to know we've done career research several times uh over over the course of many many years and when we asked that same question to folks just a couple of years ago we offered them the option of several metaphors and when asked uh, how they would describe their career using those metaphors a few short years ago, 40% said spider web, 23% said balance beam, 20% said corn maze, and a couple of bounce house. So um, thank you for, oh, I love Phoenix Rising. Yeah. Leanne. The emoji, yeah. I love it. Yeah, bonus points for the uh, for the visual, Leanne. So thanks for, for doing that. But you know, really, just wanted to get you thinking about uh, career and um, and and warmed up to the conversation that Katie and I, and we hope it'll be a conversation that we want to have with you here today. So, um, Katie, let's jump into it now that we know a little bit about the folks on the phone. Um, here's our roadmap for today. We want to share with you what we saw in the career research particularly the paradoxical attitudes that emerged when we looked at the data and when we sat back and uh, talked about the trends and the themes that were emerging. We'll certainly share with you that data and then perhaps what Katie and I like to wax poetic about most of all, how organizations and leaders consider career development or should consider career development in their larger strategy. And Katie and I are going to go back and forth today. I think the first is, uh, is for you, Katie. Great. Absolutely. So as we get started, I'm a big fan of context. Anybody that works with me knows that I like context. So as we start to talk about this concept of career, I want to place it into some context for you. Um, you know, I, when we think about what the world has been like over the past several years, I, I kind of think of it almost like a black box, right? So if you think about where we were maybe five years ago or five and a half years ago, which was the last time we asked about career development in research form to where we are now and think about all the things that have happened in this amazing, terrible, wonderful, unprecedented time in the world. Um, things like the COVID-19 pandemic, the digital disruption, the concept of multi-generational forces in the workplace, and then all of the um, catchy and sometimes alliterative uh, topics that we see about what's happening with today's workforce. We might be thinking about things like the great resignation or quiet quitting. I read an article just yesterday that said we're entering the era of the great stay or the big stay. I don't know. The term hasn't quite caught on yet. But regardless, there's a lot of attention right now to what is happening in the world of work. And so I think in some ways it's really common to have that curiosity about well, what does that mean for the workplace and the people who make up the workplace, right? The employees, you, me, everyone from individual contributors up through the C-suite. So you know, we kind of talk about it almost like this winds of change, certainly the pandemic being the biggest one, but also so many things that were already brewing and simmering before that even happened. And so you're going to see us as we go throughout this report, we're going to we're going to link to some of these factors. And we're also going to throw back to what we knew to be true in 2017, as well as what we're finding in our 2023 research. So just to kind of hold in mind, our space in the world in terms of what's happening right now and how it links to what we're talking about with career. Speaking of this year's report, um, a little bit of the nuts and bolts, what you see on the screen here is a copy of the cover of the report that you'll be receiving after the webinar. Um, from late 22 to early 2023, we asked people lots of questions about their career what they were doing now, what they wanted to be doing. We asked them about things like professional development. We asked them about the role of their leader in their career. And we're gonna break down all of these data points for you, many of them, not all. You'll see the report has much more comprehensive breakdown than the time we've got together today. But keeping it high level, we talked to both individual contributors and leaders. And we'll call out where we see differences between those two populations of people. Um, we also have a global data set, and there are some points where we saw different uh, things rising to the top in different regions of the world. So you may hear us uh, reference data from the Americas, data from EMEA, data for APAC, and you'll see some of those callouts in the report as well. 
And then as Leah mentioned, in many ways, this is the continuation of GP Strategies career research from prior years. There are some questions that we asked verbatim so that we could get a very clear apples to apples comparison from 2017 to 2023. And there are some new questions and some new options we put into questions that really reflect the current times and maybe things that weren't as relevant or curiosity points from back then. So that's a little bit about the report itself. And then I'm gonna hand it to Leah, who's gonna to start to take us through some of the findings, but maybe just a quick dose of context first. Yeah, a little more context. Um, because we'll as, we, yeah, as we sat and uh, you know, looked at the data, Katie and I, and we noticed what was emerging, you know, it felt to us like we were seeing some things where folks were saying what appeared to be on the surface, uh, seemingly contradictory thoughts. And we thought, well, are, are these contradictions? Are they inconsistencies? Are people being hypocritical in terms of what they're saying they want to talk to their leader about versus what they might leave for? And what we really said was it's an end also proposition, right? It's not they want, they're saying A, but they really want B. What emerged for us was the, the concept of paradox, that we saw paradoxes emerging through the data. So two statements that on the surface seem contradictory or absurd, but really when you dig a little bit deeper, you realize, yes, A is true and B is true at the same time. So I said to Katie that we might have to have a little buzzer if we say the word but instead of end as we progress through this. I'm in trouble. Um, Candidly, we've slipped up a little bit. That's though what we're talking about here, how uh, how folks are holding uh, two truths about career at the same time. And, and we want to unpack that. And, and perhaps, though, it's not a surprise that paradox is what emerged, because I, I do think about career as both ubiquitous and deeply personal, which is maybe an overarching paradox for the concept of career. Right? Everybody has a career, and yet what it means to each one of us is so unique to who we are and what's important to, to each one. Uh, so holding this tension or this paradox is a, is a theme that you're going to hear throughout the session. And with that, you're probably saying, well, what are those paradoxes? So let's go ahead and dig in. Okay, so the four that emerged in what we looked at was I'm more engaged in my job when I'm talking about what's next. So I'm more engaged right here when I'm talking about what's coming up. Values and strengths are important in my current job, and I'm going to prioritize financial reward in my next. Ask me what I want often, and tell me what the organization wants. And finally, perhaps the most vexing and uh, also the most relatable, my current priorities prevent me from prioritizing my development, which I say is important to me. So let's go ahead and I will cover paradox one and three and Katie's voice will chime in as we get to uh, two and four. So paradox one, I'm more engaged in my current job when talking about my next job or my future. So here's what we saw in the data. Oh, no, actually, I forgot. Okay. <laughs> I want to ask you first whether or not uh, you agree with this statement. Let's let's see where you are right now. I, I'm not asking you to project what you think we saw in the leader data. I'd love to know for you personally, to what extent do you agree that career development has been a priority for you this past year? Okay, so it looks like we're we're getting some pretty strong top two box scores here. Katie, anything surprising you as we see these bars move around? Um, it looks really similar to what you'll see in, in the next slide. So that's exciting. Yeah. Uh, it, it seems like we have a solid representation here and it's it's pretty similar. So we've got just about um most people have responded. Maybe we'll just end the poll. It looks like they've stopped coming in now. So let's end that. Um, yeah, yep. but again, right. very, very similar to what we are seeing in the numbers here that Lee is going to share momentarily. Yeah, absolutely. And I wonder if that one person, you don't have to raise your hand, but the one person who strongly disagreed uh, gave stale potentially as the metaphor. I don't know. Maybe there's a follow up in that. But let's go ahead and see what we saw in the data. Thank you for sharing. Uh, so here is what we heard in the data. I'm just moving my chat box to the side. Um, we heard that 75% top two box 
two, top two box score said career has been a priority for me. And that was fairly consistent when you looked at the breakdown of the data across individual contributors and leaders. Now, at first glance, you might say, well, there they are. There are those folks who are quitting. That's the great resignation number. The folks who are prioritizing their career development, they're the ones that have caused the turnover tsunami, the great resignation. You know, and it can be tempting to view that number in that group as folks who are not contributing, as not engaged. The truth, though, is if you look at what's on the right hand side, and this is where the left is true and the right is true, what we know from the data we've seen in these uh, results and in similar data that we've looked at in prior years is that folks are engaged when you're talking about career development. In fact, having that career development conversation has the result of improving, increasing individuals' level of engagement. So when you talk about career, you let your people know that you care about them, that you're vested in their growth and development, that you want them to be a part of the organization and their development is top of mind for you. So it stands to reason that, yes, my career is important to me and focusing on it doesn't mean that I'm not simultaneously engaged with the work that I'm doing now. And in fact, you will increase my engagement if I feel like career is a priority for me and also a priority for you. So the concern that, oh my goodness, if we plant this seed of career development conversation, if I you know, open that door and begin a discussion around career development, folks are going to suddenly realize, oh my gosh, I have a career and I can go somewhere else. And now that you brought it up, I'm going to leave. Well, of course not. That's not what happens. What is happening is that those career development conversations have the impact of increasing the engagement of the folks that are a part of your organization. And just a quick word on this, this uh, these numbers, again, are fairly consistent in terms of what we saw when we asked similar questions in prior career uh, research. So let's go ahead and also look at the next uh, slide, Katie. Here's another bit of good news. And you know we were really pleased to see just the strength of that top two box score when we said, uh, you know, will you stay? Do you think there's anything wrong with staying in the same job if you can try new things or develop my skills? 84% said, I I'm, I'm good with that. I don't think that there's anything wrong with staying in my job if I can try new things and develop my skills. So again, while folks may sometimes shy away from those career conversations, you know, if this paradox holds true and, and it has, uh, again, there's no reason to, you uh, you know, step away from those career conversations. It's not going to cause people to necessarily walk out the door as long as you can steer the conversation in the direction that they want to go and help them develop with you. Okay, so what are the implications for this paradox? I've tipped my hand just a little bit to them uh, as we've been unpacking the data, but the implications for this per first paradox, career development conversations increase engagement. They are not a one-way ticket to departure. So that is good news. And uh, one of many reasons Katie and I, I'm sure you'll guess, will endorse embracing those career discussions. And those career development conversations, let your folks know you value them. They're not a spotlight to you know, going to look for opportunities elsewhere. They send the message that you want your people to grow and you're vested in their future. And Maybe above all, it sets the stage, that conversation sets the stage for creating a win-win scenario, a win for the organization and a win for employees. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through the data. Katie, anything I didn't touch upon that you'd like to season into these uh, to this first paradox? Um, no, but I got to go backwards for a second because I just can't, I can't get my mind off of this data point. Um, I think particularly as a training professional to like, we, like I would be printing out this slide and like running to my CEO of like, wait, like if you are concerned about turnover in your organization, if you're worried about losing top performers or high potential employees, 
I think to me, this was, this to me was the number one data point that jumped out here of like, wow, maybe the key really is allowing people to try new things and develop their skills and how it links to the implication is those things can't happen without conversations, without dialogue, without knowing who your people are. And so again, it's this paradoxical, paradoxical thing where it's, got to be an organizational strategy and yet at the same time a very individualized approach and so that makes it really really complicated right um but but definitely worth it and definitely worth it all right are we ready to move to paradox two we are absolutely okay i feel like we're overdue for a little bit more audience participation so what we're going to do is launch another poll this is a, another uh duplicate of a question that we asked respondents on this year's survey and kim if you can go ahead and launch that poll i want to ask you when it comes to a career conversation which of the following is the most important for you and your manager to get on the same page about so not not what we what you think respondents said what do you think what would you want to get on the same page your values and strengths, your previous experience and roles, level of compensation, and your position slash when you might get promoted. I will also offer, if you have an other that's just screaming at you that we didn't include, you can pop it in the chat. I'd love to see if there's other, other uh, things there. All right, we had some quick participation in this one, so that's great to see. Excellent. Thank you so much for your responses. And I'm seeing an, a, quite an early lead when it comes to values and strengths, um, followed by compensation, my position, and previous experience. Excellent. We'll give it just another moment. Um, and I'm wondering here if the folks on the call are the same folks that responded to the survey, because I'm definitely seeing some parallels between what we're seeing in our findings and what we are seeing from folks on the call today. So that's that's it's actually very validating and exciting to see. Um, let's go ahead and end the poll. And I'm going to share with you, I kind of tipped the hand a little bit here, and um, I will share with you what our respondent said. So very similarly to you, oh, actually, okay, so the paradox is essentially that values and strengths are important in the current role and financial reward is important in the next role. So here's what our respondent said, same exact question. When you talk about career, what's most important? We forced people to pick one, um, just like we forced you to pick one. Um, and just like you, um, our respondents had values and strengths rise to the top. So more than half, 61% of people said the most important thing for them and their manager to get on the same page about is their values and strengths and how they can do more work that satisfies them. For me, totally unsurprising for two reasons. One, this is absolutely a continuing trend from what we've seen with career research, but also just in the field of leadership development and in the field of, of what we're seeing right now, people want to do work that works for them and they want to feel a connection to their leader, a connection to the organization, a connection to um, what they hold near and dear. Um, the other interesting part about this data though, is that the last time we asked this question, values was number one, but it was a much stronger number one at 74%. And so where we saw some of the gains, so where values is still number one, um, it's not as strong potentially as it was in the past. And we're seeing things like compensation start to creep up significantly. Um, I think there's a lot of factors that can play into this. We did see some geographic differences here, but also I can't help but consider the economy, the impact of inflation, and the fact that sometimes the struggle is really, really real and compensation is important. And you're going to see that as a theme throughout our experience. Um, it doesn't seem to be the most important, but it certainly can't be ignored. Yep. And then this is what people's current job is, you know, in their current role, what is important for them to get on the same page about. And then we asked about the next job. We had a pick list for participants and we said, pick your top three. What are the most important criteria that you will look for in your next position? And here you go. Here you start to see now the increased importance of financial reward. One, two, three, financial reward, promotion, and interesting work. So people looking for things like an increase in compensation, an increase of responsibility, and um, work that's, that's interesting to them, that challenges them, that, that, that stimulates that curiosity. I saw that term come in the chat earlier. 
So, you know, to Leah's point earlier, when we looked at the data, this was before we had even come up with the paradoxical theme. I was looking at one thing, and then I felt like I was looking at the inverse on another question. And so, again, this is related to what people are looking for um, in that next position. And to my surprise, this these three actually outranked things like remote and flexible work. I was expecting that to be far and away the number one thing that people were saying, this is what I want in my next job. But when we looked at the data, that just wasn't the case. So I think, again, it reinforces the, the notion that compensation is important. Sometimes we know that leaders and organizations shy away from career development conversations because compensation is not able to be increased or addressed at that time. But that doesn't mean that you should shy away from the conversation. Looks like we have some really good questions about the data set and sample sizes and things like that. Certainly stuff we can get to today and is also included in the report. Um, let me move on just for the time's sake and talk about some of the implications related to this. So again, the paradox of values and strengths being important now, but things like promotion and finances being important in the next role. If you're familiar with GP strategies, and I see lots of familiar faces on this call that tell me you are, but I'm going to pretend nobody knows, um, you may know about our X model of engagement. And I'm going to explain it just briefly to set the stage for what this means for implications for this paradox. When you know, we talk about the term engagement in general, I feel like people think about it only on this one plane. Am I happy in the job that I do? Am I engaged? And we would say, yeah, at GP Strategies, we would say that's important. The concept of satisfaction, do I derive value out of the work that I do? Does it work for me? Um, but so too are important of the needs of the organization. And so we take individual satisfaction and also look at things like organizational contribution. You might be happy, happy, happy doing your job, but are you contributing to the maximum level? Are you doing what the organization wants and needs you to do? And only when maximum contribution and maximum satisfaction are reached is what we call full engagement. So thinking about this in the context of a career conversation, it's really important to discuss things like both contribution and satisfaction, remembering that although contribution in many ways is usually clearly defined by the organization, things like mission, vision, values, strategy statements. Satisfaction is often a very individualized equation, just like careers are. So the phrase I always like to use is what makes you tick and what ticks you off, right? That is individual to each person, the role that work plays in your life, the value that you derive out of the work that you do. And so when leaders are engaging in career conversations, they have to consider both the organization and the individual. And when they're talking with the latter, thinking about things like both values and compensation. Um, and really helping to create the win for both. Again, this is about a, a model that considers both the needs of the individuals and organizations and how to, thanks Leanne, I see that, um, and, and how to really fulfill those. Leah, is there anything before we move on to number three that you'd like to add? You know, I just see some comments in the chat and uh, somebody pointed out that, you know, maybe the paradox about uh, the, the values and compensations comes partially mm. from a view that compensation can't be negotiated in their current role, but might be when looking at roles externally. And I think that's really a fair, a fair call out and, and wanted to highlight that comment, right? Perhaps, you know, um, being able to, if you're going to make the change and upset the, the apple cart, right? Because there's a lot involved when you choose to change jobs, you know, certainly you, you are going to look long and hard at compensation and to this individual's point in the chat, be able to negotiate it. So um, again, pointing out why, as we looked at this, yes, both are true simultaneously. I want to talk about what's important to me right now, where I am. And if I look, yeah, that's that's a real factor, especially we know with inflation and uh, what's going on in the world. So so you are noticing or sharing in the chat what Katie and I surfaced again, which is A is true and B is true at the same time. And, and that's OK. You know, let's talk about what that what the implications of that are, which is what we're doing here today. OK, and Leah, so, I think that I was going to say, I think that also correlates with some of the data you see about the financial benefit of job hopping. Right. So people knowing that they can potentially make more money if they leave a role. And the thing is, is they may not even want to leave, but they feel like that's what they may need to do to make more money, which may be, again, we're seeing as an increasing 
um, consideration for people when it comes to their careers. So I think that these are definitely really relevant and necessary conversations for organizations to be having about, you know, checking out things like the compensation strategy um, and really figuring out, you know, potentially how to meet those needs to keep great performers in place. Absolutely. Okay, so let's go to, I'm keeping an eye on the clock, let's go to yep. paradox number three. Ask me what I want often and tell me what the organization wants. So let's go ahead and unpack that data. Uh, can we talk, right? So we asked folks, how often, how frequently would you like to talk to your manager about career development? Um, so 81% want to talk quarterly or more frequently. And that's up just a little bit from the data that we saw uh, when we asked it in prior studies. Um, now, what I also want to talk about is you whether or not folks are actually engaging in those career conversations with the frequency uh, that they're desired. And, and we have some historical data on this. So um, we know that people, 81%, want to talk about their career more than once a month, monthly or quarterly. So I would put those in the, in the frequently bucket. What I'd like to ask those on the phone is to share with me, you know, on, on average or in general, when you think about the leaders in your organization, how often do you feel they are actually having a career development conversation in, yeah, so let's, so Aletha is saying quarterly, Leah is saying once a year, love your name and how you spell it, uh, never, okay, zero, quarterly, two times a year, not as often as they should, annually, okay, so what I want to share with you is that historically the data has shown, and I want to make sure I get these numbers right because they're not on the slide, that um, the reality is leaders are 64% never or annually having these career conversations. So 36% said they annually have the career conversation and 27% said never. So there was, when we asked this data previously, and, and still um, based on the conversations we're having with leaders in organizations, a gap between the frequency with which folks want to have career conversations and the frequency with which they're actually taking place. So can we talk? Yes. And we should be talking on a more regular basis. Now, when folks talk to their folks talk to their leaders and they bring them into the career development conversation let's talk for a little bit about what role they want them to play so that was the next question that we asked talk to them re frequently and when you talk to them you know do you want them to play a role in supporting your career development 96% pretty staggering number said yes i want my leader to play a role in my development i want to talk to them frequently and i want them involved i was a little surprised by that 96% that that's pretty high i thought we might see a few more who were perhaps hands off in terms of that discussion i know it impacts engagement but that is a really high number 96% said yeah i want them to play some role in my career development now what does that role look like? What is it that they want them to do? Um, in addition to the conversation around values and challenging work, they said, connect me with opportunities, right? Be that connector for me to opportunities within the organization. You learn about my values. You learn what's important to me. Leader, you're in a role to then help me understand how I can grow ideally within the organization. What I was initially surprised about was that middle number. They also said, yeah, if you have a bias leader for where I should go next or what you think might be you know, good for me, I want to know, tell me. And if the organization has a bias, that would be helpful to know too. So you know, I think what they're saying in that message is help me visualize a path, help me visualize a way that I can grow within the organization and who is a better position to have that conversation, really no one than that direct leader or manager. And then you can see the other thing that folks wanted to talk about uh, and the role they wanted that leader to play was that important compensation discussion. Maybe not a discussion that you're going to have with as much frequency as folks revealed in our prior uh, data point, but certainly compensation is part of that discussion uh, on a somewhat regular basis, not as, not as regular as values and skills, but it does keep bubbling up as something that 
shouldn't be ignored. So what are the implications of this? Talk to me frequently, connect me, help me see what the opportunities are. Well, as Katie and I were, were talking about this, I said, you know, clearly we need to underscore, as she did in the X model, that employees need to, uh, need to own their own engagement and they need to own their own development. We talked about sharing your values with your manager, your job condition, your work priorities. Well, in order to do that, in order to engage in that dialogue, employees need to get clear on what those are if they aren't already. They need to communicate what they need um, and keep that growth mindset. Leaders, though, in those hopefully frequent conversations that they're having are so critical. And the, the metaphor that I kept thinking of or the visual that I had in mind is I picture leaders in this sort of swivel chair, which I, I had already. I didn't pull it up for this webinar. And they look to the left and hear the employees that they're having conversations with. They need to understand for each employee, what are the values? What are the skills that they want to expand and grow? What are the job conditions within which they do their best work? And then they pivot to the right, and hopefully they have a line of sight into the organization. What new efforts are coming up? What new opportunities are coming down the pike? Where is there a role that matches really well with the values and, and skills maybe that uh, Katie talked to me about in my last conversation? So they play that, that role, whether you call it a fulcrum or they're sitting in a swivel chair, they are that connector. And um, they need to do what, what we see in this center here. Keep a clear line of sight to what's coming and be able to advocate for your people. And you can only advocate for them if you understand what's important to them and you're engaging in that regular dialogue. And then certainly we expect, anticipate, hope that they're sharing talent for that greater good, right? There was that book, Multipliers, that was incredibly popular a couple of years back. And, and a lot of it was based on the fact that leaders need to be those multipliers, that sharing of talent uh, throughout the organization for the greater good. So um, employees play a role, leaders play a role, and certainly the organization uh, sets a, a great deal of context and puts structure in place around compensation, stretch assignments, training, and things of the like. But I can't underscore enough the importance of the leader in playing that role of connector and engaging in those not annually um, and, and maybe not even twice and, and certainly not never, but frequent career conversations. Sorry, I feel like I'm about to come through the screen on this issue because it is such an important one. Katie, anything you want to, uh, to add here? Um, oh my gosh, there's so much, this whole, I feel like the webinar could be this one slide, right? I guess the one thing that I want to say is I think something that's really common that I hear from clients and, um, is, you know, unfortunately the experience of feeling supported and developed in your career is really dependent upon the manager. And so there's a very, um, disparate experience from maybe one manager to another, from one business unit to another, like it's very dependent on that person. And so I think, some of that may always be true just based on personal characteristics. And, but I, I, to me, it also underscores the need for the organization to set the standard, right? To put the supports in place, to put the accountability in place. This is not just a nice to have, it's necessary for the survival of the organization and for being um, proficient in the role. So I really think about it from that organizational lens. How can we set leaders up for success? How do we equip them to do things like have career conversations and development conversations? And I just really feel like that can help equalize the playing field um, for all uh, individuals at an organization. Great. I think you get the final paradox. All right. Hey, wow. Where is the time going? And um, we're on time, which is an awesome feeling. So let me start to round towards home base here and cover the fourth of four paradoxes. Um, and as Leah related, um, the probably most relatable to all of us, my current priorities prevent me from prioritizing my development. Um, raise your hand for if this is true for you. If anybody else, this is totally true for me. I don't know about for you. Definitely would love to hear your experience. I was sharing the story with Leah that like, there was a training thing that I signed up for last week that I ended up not going to because things got really busy, right? My day-to-day -day just eclipsed everything else that I had planned for that day. There was something that came up. It was urgent, needed to be addressed with. Um, once again, the struggle can be very real. And we saw that loud and clear from our participants in the survey as well. Let me show you what that looks like from a data perspective. 
here's some great news. The desire for development is high. Think back to the question we talked about with, hey, there's nothing wrong with being in the same job. If I can try new things or develop my skills. We asked people, if your organization offered professional development opportunities, how likely would you be to take advantage? And look at the favorable response. So we're looking here at 74% of folks globally that we surveyed, nearly three quarters said, yeah, I would be likely or very likely. Um, and, you know, I always look at those favorable numbers and I think, wow, that's great. But, and I think there's almost something more interesting to be learned from people that were like, nope, not interested, not at all, not at all likely, or maybe somewhat. So what we did in the survey was we actually took kind of those like lukewarm or unfavorable responses and asked some follow-up questions. Hey, people, if you said that you were somewhat likely, um, why? Like, what would be holding you back or what would have to change in order for you um, to be able to, um, to access those professional development opportunities? And we got some things like, we heard things like, hey, I already know what I need to know to do my job. Okay, cool. Or, hey, I'm retiring and I don't really want to go to training anymore. Fine. Um, but what do you think? I'd be very curious from your perspective before I tell you what people told us, hey, what holds you back? from pursuing professional development. Um, throw in the chat, what do you think people said? What do you think? When we said, why wouldn't you, uh, if you were either somewhat or not at all likely, why not? What's holding you back? No time, too busy, time and finances, time, too much work, ah, lack of opportunities, too many for me to do. Yeah, time or capacity, absolutely. Oh, manager not supportive, that hurts my heart. Um, yeah, absolutely. Keep those coming. Um, we saw kids. I knew you were going to sneak that in there, Leah. <laughs> that was not an option on the pick list. Um, but let me tell you, ooh, Stuart, that's a really good one. Opportunities don't match goals. Um, don't know what's available. That's a big one that we talk about with clients is how do we start to socialize and, and expand those opportunities. Here are the top two drivers. When we ask people who were not at all or somewhat likely, they said time and competing priorities. And I, again, I completely relate to this. I'm sure many of us can as well. I think you probably, uh, for those putting it in the chat, maybe that's resonant or relevant to you as well. Um, but I think it's really important to understand. So for those of you on the call that are responsible for training functions and you're thinking, you know, how do I drive uh, utilization of, you know, training uh, training software that I've purchased or how do I drive traffic into my classes? Some, some people don't have that problem. But if you do, thinking about what we're hearing from learners or potential learners about the things that get in the way, I think that can be really valuable. But remember, most people said, I'm, I'm here for it. When they didn't, this is the reason why, okay? So people are telling us like, this is really, really important to me. However, stuff gets in the way. Um, and, you know, one of the more interesting points that uh, I wanted to bring out as well is, you know, employees are spending some time on our development. And this is like kind of sad, but only 43% of employees said that they were spending the right amount of time on their development. So what this tells me is that people are hungry for more. They want to be doing more. They would be pursuing opportunities if they were offered to them. I think some great opportunities in the chat here, maybe travel's an issue, maybe they don't know what's available, maybe they don't see how the opportunity relates to their need, their job, their career. Um, but when I see a stat like this, I think about there's a lot of room for growth. There's maybe there's a lot of room for talking with our learners and our leaders about um, what does growth and development look like and, and what are, you know, what are the ways that we can mitigate some of those barriers like time and competing priorities. So it seems like, um, again, if you build it, they will come, except if there's not enough time or competing priorities. And I really do want to do more in my development realm. So what does this mean? Um, I think, you know, when I think about implications, um, a big one could be aligning career development as part of the organization strategy. Back to what I said before, it's not just an extra or a nice to have or something that just depends on whether the leader likes it or thinks it's important or not. This is actually something that's baked into the fabric of the organization. It's an expectation. Um, it's baked into things like onboarding and performance reviews and all throughout the employee life cycle, we're talking about career development. And I think there's such an awesome offshoot of that too, when you think about what that can do for the caliber of candidates you're attracting, your employer brand, your um, candidate and employee experience. But again, that could be a whole other webinar. Um, creating a culture of development, easier said than done, right? Again, the whole webinar could be focused on what it means to create a culture of development. But maybe what it means off the jump is defining or redefining what development even means. 
here at GP Strategies, we talk about, you know, career development doesn't always mean up. It doesn't always mean a promotion or increased job responsibilities. Maybe we're looking at development in a different way, stretch assignments, mentorships, um, the opportunity to be exposed to different people and opportunities that might help level up their career. Clearing those hurdles to former formal development, again, when it's lack of time, when it's competing priorities, um, maybe we think about shorter chunks of learning. Maybe we look at things like asynchronous learning that someone can complete on their own time. Maybe we think about dedicating, I know there are organizations that dedicate whole days to learning um, or periods of time that employees can take out of their flow of work and do learning. So there are, so I see Amy's getting excited. Me too, Amy, me too. So there, so there are, again, it's personal, but there's also so many organizational structural pillars that can be put into place to help facilitate and cultivate the conditions under which this can happen. And then last, but never, ever, ever, ever least, talk to your people. None of these things is, are possible if you don't understand who your people are, what they need, what makes them tick, what ticks them off, what is what are the needs of the people in your organization? And so for you on the call today, that's definitely something I would want to leave with. I think it applies to all four paradoxes. It's all built on communication. And of course, a huge underpinning of that is trust. So as we go towards home base, we're gonna have time for questions, which is always a great thing. Let's talk about, um, let me refresh for you what the four paradoxes are. So paradox one, where have we been today? I'm more engaged in my current job when I'm talking about my next job or the future. The second paradox, values and strengths are important in my current job. Financial reward is important in my next job. Paradox three, ask me what I want often and tell me what the organization wants. And then paradox four, current priorities preventing me from prioritizing my development. As I mentioned before, all of these paradoxes, the data that underpins them, the demographics, a much more contextual breakdown is located in the report. So there might be some questions that we may not have time to get to today, but should be addressed in the report. We're also going to provide our contact information um, for you as well. But as we close, let's talk about maybe some high level implications. And there's a lot of text in this slide. My, org, uh, my instructional design mind is a little bit, ah, but, but we do have implications both here and in the report for individuals, for people leaders and for organizations. And maybe for time's sake, we just pick like maybe one or two from each one. So let me start with, uh, uh, with individuals. I think that last one, prioritizing development is really important. So understanding your people at that individual dyadic level, what, who are they? What obstacles are in the way of them developing themselves? What do they even want out of their career and of their life? And, and how can you help make that possible for them? Leo, what stands out for you with people leaders? So with people leaders, and I'm not going to be able to summarize it to one or two, <laughs> but tough. I will try. So, so key message for people leaders in my mind is engage in those conversations, the career conversations, don't be afraid of them. Be really clear, get really clear through that conversation what's important to your people. Again, that's an individualized equation. That's a unique discussion based on each person. And then use what you know about the organization, opportunities, stretch assignments, you know, new roles, learning and development, um, mentorship, the things that you know are available that your folks might not know about and be that, be that connector for them. For me, that's really a critical role. Don't be afraid of those conversations and then um, play that role of connector. And, and the other thing that we didn't call out um, you know, specifically, but was a big part of why we wanted to look at this research in this way was, you know, we put a lot of pressure on people leaders to engage in career conversations, make sure you're developing your people. And, you know, a couple of times as we looked at the data, we found ourselves saying, you know, people leaders are people too. And, you know, we wanted to find out how they were prioritizing their own development or if they were, because I think if you're not prioritizing your development in some way, in a way that works despite time and competing priorities, 
it can feel like a grind, right? And you can start to feel a fatigue factor and a cynicism because that growth and development is lacking and you're not sure what the future looks like. So that's the kind of dialogue that I think we need to encourage. Um, the people leaders need to play a pivotal role. And I think reflecting on what they need to grow and develop is a, is a piece of the puzzle that we certainly don't want to overlook. Oh, Leah, I could cry. That makes me so happy. I, I talk about this with clients all the time. Like we can't just look at people leaders as a function of their roles, right? We have to look at them as people too. And by the way, that applies to all of us who work in HR and talent development as well. Like don't fall into the trap of just, this is your role and it's your responsibility to provide for others. Like your career is important too. And I think, you know, it's, it really is that individualized approach and every person taking accountability and responsibility for their own career while at the same time, the organization is setting standards and equipping people leaders and holding them accountable to having those conversations. Let's split the difference on organizations. Want to pick a couple things that stick out. I, for me, when I think about organizational implications, it's always where my mind goes. I think two words jump out for me, equity and clarity. Listen, this should not be, again, something that depends on whether or not somebody likes it or not, right? These should be equitable. Um, experiences throughout the organization, regardless of where you sit, regardless of who your leader is. And then clarity, I think, again, clarity of expectation, clarity of role, clarity of, you know, what does development or career conversations even look like, and really setting that standard for equipping both people leaders and individuals to engage in those conversations with, um, with just trust and hopefully ultimately great results. What about you, Leah? Yeah, I mean, I would say equity is the other one that jumps out at me. So, or, or the one, the word that I'm sort of most attracted to in that last section. So making sure there is that, um, you know, equitable access to new opportunities, equity in career paths, I think is, uh, is, is critical. So, and, and, you know, and I do think also having the organization put in some guardrails around what those conversations should, should look like giving support tools to both people, leaders, and individuals to facilitate that conversation, putting parameters in place around frequency. Um, I think that will help both people, leaders, and individuals know that this is, expectation feels like such a strong and foreboding word, but, but an expectation that these conversations are, are happening, are, are being had, or are being held, you know, and that, and that they're a critical part of what the organization values. So um, those are some of the ways I think the organization needs to show up that uh, I'd call out in that last column for sure. Excellent. Thanks, Leah. <gasps> hey, we made it to a defined time for questions and answers that we actually have time to take questions, which is a great, uh, great feeling. I do see a couple that have come in the chat. I know I may have lost a couple with the thread. So um, please feel free to ask. I see a question. Um, I see, hi, Michelle. I see a question from Michelle. So Michelle says, can you speak to who should take initiative, either the individual or the manager? Oh, Leah, you or me. This is such a great question. You know, I actually was was trying to touch a little bit upon that in, in my last comment. I saw mm -hmm. Michelle's um, question there. So I do think that uh, the organization, it's helpful when an organization can put some guardrails in place around that frequency so that that expectation is set here and then cascaded uh, down, uh, you know, giving certainly a, a cadence or a calendar to how frequently you hope those discussions will take place, providing tools and resources, whether that's a career workshop, a roadmap. Um, but I think really, you know, having those conversations be an expectation from the top down is, is a good place to start, Michelle. Uh, and then that sets the stage for the leader and the individual coming together to have that discussion. Mm -hmm. um, but I, so that's, that's what I would say is how I'd suggest um, that initiative be encouraged. Um, and likely the manager might take a slightly more, I would say, prominent role in um, in establishing those conversations, again, based on some expectations that I think it's important for the organization to set. Katie, what do you think? Oh, gosh, you know, hey, in a perfect world, we would put everybody through a training and talk to them about career conversations that we train leaders and individual contributors. And some of our clients do. And that is like, 
a gift. It is amazing. But also we recognize that sometimes budget bandwidth and resources don't allow for that. So I think you're right. I think it's about resources. Sometimes that looks like training. Sometimes that looks like a toolkit or an asynchronous experience. You know, sometimes an organization can only afford or have the ability to invest in one population. So they train their leaders. Cool. That's great. And we always provide resources for them to give to their people and vice versa. If an organization is training individual contributors, we have a little manager appendix, uh, like an addendum that we can send. So we get people on the same page. Like maybe you make one population fluent and you make the other one at least conversant, right? We're starting. Ideally, we're all going to be fluent in that beautiful language of career conversations, but also understand that can't always be the case. But I, I, Leah, to your point, I think it does start with the organization expecting, you know, setting those standards and again, making it really woven into the fabric of that organization. Are there any other questions? Ah, I see a question here. Is there an appropriate way for individual contributors to press the issue of career development when a manager seems less than enthused about those opportunities that are being presented? You want to take it or you want me to? This question hurts. It hurts because it's real. Um, it's real. And, and sadly, I feel like maybe there are some of us that have experienced that in the past and, and it can be really, really challenging. Again, this I think is where if it is an expectation of the job, it's going to be much more um, likely impossible to hold that leader accountable, right? And so I think, you know, so th there's kind of the accountability lens, but then there's also the curiosity lens for me of like, what would be holding that leader back, right? Does that leader have some myths about career development that might be holding them back? I don't want to lose this person. The ones we hear a lot, I don't want to lose this person. I can't give them a raise. I don't have time. You know, are there ways that we can understand that leader's experience to really understand what are the barriers that are holding them back? Leah, any thoughts from your mind? No, I think that's great. I, I do think though, um, you know, it, that is a, that is a, tough spot for an individual contributor to be in. I, I would say, you know, one of the things that we saw in the data the last time is that, you know, this idea of wanting to have career conversations a little more informally and regularly. So there may be ways to talk about, um, you know, places you want to grow or things that you want to try or, you know, what might be a, a next step for you without necessarily, um, you know, having the conversation with the leader in a way that's too threatening or too formal. So sort of incorporate some of those discussion points into what I hope is at least a regular cadence of one-on-ones. Um, you know, that sounds a little bit like a backdoor approach to career development, and I'd much rather have it be a very clear discussion about, you know, career and growth and movement. That being said, if a manager is resistant, um, I, I think that uh, an employee can still find ways to talk about growth and development with them. And then if they're not getting that from their manager, my hope would be, again, the organization might have mentors or sponsors, mm -hmm. other people, you know, that can play that role for the individual, even if their direct manager is, you know, is phoning great it point. in with respect to this issue. Yeah, that's a great point. Oh, I knew this was going to happen. I knew we were going to run out of, not run out of time, but there's probably so many more questions that we could answer. To that point, I'm going to let Kim wrap up. And then I'm also going to put our contact information on the screen too. So you can reach out for any follow-up questions that come to your mind. Go ahead, Kim. Thank you, ladies, Leah and Katie, for such a great discussion. And of course, for our participants who are on the call today, I love the conversation going on. I want to send a big thank you out for you joining us and your time and attention. We want you to come back and join us for another upcoming webinar. So visit GP Strategies website to view future sessions. And I wish everyone on the call a wonderful and productive rest of your day. This webinar is brought to you by GP Strategies. Together, we can create a world where business excellence makes possibilities achievable. You can access more webinars or download additional resources at gpstrategies.com forward slash resource hyphen library.